Good morning. It is my great uh, honor and pleasure to present uh, Philip today, who is going to be giving the grand round. Uh, Philip is a dear colleague and a very good uh, personal friend, and overall he's my mentor as well, so it's a great honor to have him here today. Uh, Philip did his medical school and uh, medical training in Iraq. Then he did his uh, fellowship and PhD in pharmacology in uh, England, in Guy's Hospital. Then a small fellowship at MD Anderson and joined uh, Wayne State after that. Uh, at, uh, Philip, of course, uh, is very well known in the field uh, of GI oncology and specifically in pancreas. Uh, he has been a pivotal uh, thought leader in uh, the cooperative groups and in a number of national and international studies that have uh, really shaped and defined uh, the field in pancreas cancer. So with that, I really look forward to the presentation Thank today. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. <clears throat> Thank you, Basil, for the kind introduction. And uh, Basil is a colleague, friend, and family. Um, I remember when you used to call me at night, uh, my, my wife used to say, your boyfriend has called you. <laughs> because we would spend an hour chatting. Those were great days. Unfortunately, um, we had to lose you, but for a much better life. And we congratulate you for that, for everything you've done. So um, I'm going to uh, spend the next 40, 45 minutes uh, discuss pancreatic cancer, the positive of the negatives. And I didn't know what title to put, but uh, I recently gave a talk somewhere, and uh, when I shared it with my junior faculty, he said it was a spinning of the negative into positive. So, so um, I think that's what I'm trying to do here uh, from the outside. But from real, my real purpose for this is just to ask people to think a bit more with me and help us how to really uh, deal with this disease. These are my disclosures. Now, one of the real things we're facing with pancreatic cancer is that it's becoming, it will become the second cause of cancer death uh, in the next five, 10 years. And this is um, an alarming development because uh, uh, with all other cancers, uh, including lung, which was so resistant, and melanoma, people have done well. But with pancreatic cancer, we're still struggling. And um, this created some sort of an urgency. And, um, but still, we are lagging behind in terms of funding. So uh, people who do uh, breast cancer or they, they work on uh, pancreatic or prostate cancer, they, they see the funding really much easier than what happens in pancreatic cancer. This is an old slide, but it just gives you an idea. And if you look at the number of people dying of pancreatic cancer, which is even more than pa patients dying of prostate cancer, still prostate cancer, for example, attracts more. And nowadays, there are more people dying of pancreas cancer than breast cancer. So you can see how the differential is even more. And one of the reasons for that is the fact that we don't have champions. Because all our patients who are celebrities and uh, get the disease and die, uh, they're not there to really uh, to, uh, to help us in terms of uh, uh, moving the funding line forward. And, um, and even in, 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 in patients like families who I know, uh, they were, they're very active in fundraising for the first two, three years, and then they just want to forget about it. So we don't have some good champions to help us with the disease. For those of you who thought I'm going to give a talk on gemnapaclitaxel or fulfrenox, this is the only thing I'm going to refer to. It's a slide, and you have one-fourth of it, which is there were four studies in the front line that uh, were like, if you would, the standard of care studies. And uh, you can see that... Uh, uh, you can hardly put a, a, a laser pointer between the curves, which tells you that the benefit is really very inc small increment and clinically of uh, sometimes in, some, in many patients of doubtful benefit. So we don't have good new treatments. And uh, I, I, I want to make sure that uh, everyone understands that we don't have standards of care. To me, this, these are not standards of care. They need to be improved. So with that in mind, um, many years ago, uh, there was a meeting at the NCI, and the question was, what do we do? We're getting a lot of negative trials. And we, we produced a, a sort of white paper which said that no more phase three trials in pancreatic cancer, full stop. And in fact, if you look back over the last 10 years, the cooperative groups did not produce a single phase three trial. And, and we, don't, we don't even have a phase three trial ongoing 
uh, in pancreatic cancer in this country based on the CTEP or the NCI. Uh, this, the reason was, unless you're ready for an idea to take it to the phase three, don't take it there because like it happened with erlotinib with a two-week median survival benefit, uh, maybe you can get a p-value, but at the end, no one's going to use the drug, which is exactly what happened. So that was the idea. Now, most recently, uh, we may have made some improvement, which is by repackaging the ironotecan into a liposomal. Again, how much benefit is that to the patient? So we don't have that. And then we moved into era of the target therapies. We thought we, thought we were smart. We did many studies. And, and each arrow here uh, represents a, at least one trial, and mostly large randomized trials. So just not to go to, uh, through everything, well, we hit the EGFR multiple ways. We went to the vascular, the, the neoadjuvant, sorry, the, the um, VEGF, VEGFR. Am I doing anything wrong? So the VEGF, VEGFR pathway was hit multiple times. Uh, you went on the IGF-1R, uh, STAT, um, everything was hit and nothing really came out of it, including MEC, which is downstream of RAS. Not only that, we said, okay, let's just do multiple combinations, and we hit both VEGF and EGFR, we hit both IGF-1R and EGFR, and even MEC and AKT, and nothing really worked. So, so it's a major disappointment in terms of uh, how we do the clinical trials. So this is exactly where the positive of the negative comes, where the researchers, how do we really learn from these studies? Well, this is an old slide I've shown a lot, which is if you have a network like this of signaling, how do you really block uh, one signal pathway and make sure that you block the whole thing? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, my example I use, my mother used to live here, and my wife's aunt lives here, and there are roadworks on Sundays on the, uh, in the uh, underground stations, and then you still can get to Victoria from, uh, from that other end of the, you can do that. So blocking one signal doesn't help. Unfortunately, the only way you can block all the signals is like this one, which is like when you have a strike of the underground workers in Paris, so they block everything. But how can you do that in itself? So just uh, to move forward, uh, over the last uh, 12, 14 months, these are the number of studies that were reported to be negative. And they include a range of uh, ibofosamide, a, a, a cytotoxic drug, a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, heparin mimetic, tyrosin kinase inhibitor, some vaccines out there, notch inhibitor for the stem cell people, and also MUC1 inhibitor. And there's another study of a notch inhibitor I didn't put here was in ASCO GI. So truly, many, many thousands, many hundreds and few thousands of patients, I think there will be close to 3,000 patients, futile therapies. So what does this mean for us? Well, what did we learn? And I think this is really very important, and uh, I have to stress that these are the things which I think we learned. And, and I'd be happy to hear from you if there's something else we learned, or do you think we didn't learn these things, which would be different. So clinical trials do not match the molecular complexity of this disease. This is a fact. And even if you look at diseases like uh, lung cancer, we get excited about the proportion of the patients who do well, but still, those patients don't do well forever. But for the bigger proportion of patients, it's, like, it's really like pancreatic cancer. We really, there's a complex disease which has been simplified for us by chance, maybe, or by intention recently by having those driver gene mutations, which we don't have in pancreatic cancer. But there are a lot of patients out there where it really applies to that. Molecular, it's a complex, and the way we do clinical trials and make assumptions really do not match. A drug resistance, because we use the old CTEP, other uh, required clinical trials designs, which they don't match the complexity of the disease. And then in this disease, there's drug resistance. Well, I, I knew this when I started training in oncology in 1986. It's no different. So when people come to me and say, let's deliver more cytotoxics by putting a nanoparticle, or let's jack up the dose or add another drug, really, how much is going to help you except for making the patient iller? because this is a drug-resistant disease. So we should be thinking away from cytotoxics. We may need them for a platform to add drugs. We may need them for cytoreduction for some patients, but and a single gene product certainly failed. I, mean, I showed you all these studies, all these studies, thousands of patients who had them. It didn't work. And then if we believe that RAS, which is an early gene mutation, is important in this disease, still unchecked, because we don't know how to, uh, to attack RAS. And, uh, and also, here, 
the opportunities will be outside of the cell and the genome of the cell. What I mean by that is that we've been hitting the cancer cell, IGF-1R, EGFR, this, that, but it may be that we should start thinking of outside of the cancer cell and the microenvironment. And that's really what's, I think, happening now. So one of our local foundations had a nice logo saying pancreatic cancer in search for an answer or something like that. So, that, so it's true. We're still searching for an answer. So where do we stand? Now at this time in, in February of 2017, there are three areas which are, which are attracting attention in terms of research. One of them is uh, stromal targeting, so we're talking about microenvironment. The other one is the immune inflammatory cell. Of course, everyone's doing that. And then exploiting the DNA repair vulnerability. So I'm just going to expand on these three. So if you're a pathologist or if you're not a pathologist, if you look under the microscope, this disease attracts a lot of interest in the way that there is lots of fibrosis and stroma uh, between the cancer cells. And it's very dense. And we think that this uh, stroma is uh, promoting the cancer progression and carcinogenesis. And we, with our simple mind, and I have to stress, with our simple mind, we think that it limits drug delivery. And also we know for a fact in experimental systems that this stroma contributes to the immune suppressive environment or the phenotype of these. Now for me, again, I'm even simpler than simple mind. I believe in, like these are the resins are the tumor cells and you have lots of the rest in a, in a, in a, in a cookie, which uh, some of you had this morning. And this is stroma, microenvironment, has tons of elements in it that makes it very complex. So for the young people in the, in the audience, this is where your money is, I think. This is where you're going to work. But in, unfortunately, it's not like you hit a fibroblast or you hit a stellar cell or you hit a thing. It has to be more innovative in the way you think of it. And I have to stress this point multiple times, the way you think of putting the drugs together, and it should be innovative in how you select the patients. So that's really your work until you retire. So again, to go into one of the recent uh, interests in this disease, uh, if you have the cancer cells, and there is an extracellular matrix, in this case I'm picking on hyaluronan, and I use the expression uh, biologic cement. It's like the cement between the bricks and all that. So it really, from our th simple thinking, it, it, it uh, stops the, or, or acts as a bar barrier between the drugs, or like, like, <clears throat> like the therapeutic ligands and the, and the cell. And, and the nice thing is that you can measure this expression with the immunohistochemistry, chemistry, and 35 to 40% of the patients have an overexpression of this protein. And then preclinically, there are two uh, independent groups, uh, very respected groups of uh, cancer research. They've looked into this by adding uh, a drug which can dissolve this, hyaluronidase, which breaks it down. You can improve the delivery of the drugs to the tumor cell and get better survival in mice. So that led to a number of studies. This was the first study which was done by Sunil Hangarani, who was the PI. It was actually sponsored by the company. And in patients who had untreated metastatic disease, they were given napaclitaxel gemcitabine, which is today's, today's um, recipe. Everyone uses that for clinical trials, plus minus PEG PH20. So the primary endpoint was PFS for the entire group, but also in the, in the primary uh, endpoint was the frequency of venous thromboembolic events, because this drug can increase venous thromboembolic events. Now this slide here shows you the difference in progression-free survival in the subgroup of patients who had pH uh, uh, high. Now the company tells us uh, through its press release that even in the entire group there was improvement in the progression-free survival, but they do not give us a, a curve to look at, but I'm giving you what we have. And um, this was supposed to be a presentation, ASCO GI, but it was withdrawn as a presentation Instead of presentation, the company did a press release with PDF files of the slides on the, on, the, on the website, if anyone wants to go to the website. So there was an improvement significant in patients with a high HA. And if you look at the venous thromboembolic events, the bottom line is that you have to use low molecular weight heparin, so it adds another drug to your treatment. And if you do that, then you can cut down uh, by a fourth the incidence of the thromboembolic events. We at SWOG were doing a study with uh, the same combina with, this, with the same drug using clofenox, but at SWOG obviously we were very poor, so we used aspirin. It didn't work, so we went back into using uh, also molecular heparin. This study is now 120 patients out of, out of 170, 
but the company wouldn't wait for anybody. They started off the phase three trial of Gemnaplaxitas of plus minus PEG phase 20, and this will be only in patients who have a high expression of the, of the protein. It takes four, five to eight days for a, a, a turnaround time for the test, if you can wait that long for your patients. So this study is already ongoing. So this is one area that's uh, attracting uh, interest. Now, uh, the PEG-PH20 is not the only way you can attack the stroma. There are other ways, the hedgehog inhibitors, we'll come back to that. Uh, you can use agonistic antibodies to CD40, vitamin D analogs, and there are at least one or two studies looking into that. And also, the old theory we had, nap taxa, which I think it's probably doesn't do that. It can destroy the, that was the initial uh, selling point for the compound. However, I have to, before someone jumps into saying, well, did, uh, did you know about this paper? I also have to warn you that uh, the depleting the stroma or attacking the stroma may also have negative effects. I mean, the stroma is there for a reason, but that reason can be negative, but also can be positive. So this study, which was a very elegant trial, and I, anyone who's interested has, has to go back and read this, this came on the heels of the failure of hedgehog inhibitor in the clinic. So when they did a clinical trial of hedgehog inhibitor plus chemotherapy, that trial was a failure. In fact, the patients did worse. And then the group from Columbia sit, uh, sat down and designed a, a preclinical experiment. And in fact, the bottom line is that there's a lot of information. I don't want to spend time on it. But the stromal elements, they act, can, also can act as a restraint to, the, uh, to, your, uh, to your biology, aggressive biology of the tumor. So it's not as simple as that. Okay, so moving out of the... Uh, out of that, we, we, uh, let's go into the other part of uh, the interest, which is developing, which is uh, attacking the uh, macrophages. So if you look at the uh, uh, different tumors, like breast, lung, and pancreatic, you can see that there are less T cells in, 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 um, in, in pancreatic cancer. But a more recent study I read a few days ago, uh, they looked into the T cell repertoire in, in pancreas cancer, and they say, well, it's not that different from um, from patients with melanoma. So it may be that the T cells are not that different, but the immune suppressive environment is a problem. Things that are putting a break on their, their ability to attack the cancer cells. And one of the things is that we see more myeloid cells in pancreatic uh, tumors. And this is a, a, a fact that has been consistently been proven in a number of studies. So with that in mind, uh, I, uh, I'm showing you the life cycle history of, of um, uh, macrophages. So they're derived from a number of elements from monocytes, from tissue resin macrophages. And I don't want to really uh, uh, go into details, but ultimately they end up in the tumor cells and they have a number of biological activities, mostly not good, not all of them not good, but mostly not good in, for the tumor. So the immune suppressive, the angiogenesis, drug resistance, etc. this is all happening because of these macrophages. But the reason why I put this thing, this slide up, is to show you that there are thousands of elements that you have to control here when you go therapeutic. So that's why I'm saying you have a life, lifetime uh, job to go into this. And, and if you're really interested, I think there's a lot of things to do, to do here uh, for you as a young investigator putting things together. Now, it goes into combinations. It goes into how do you really uh, develop biomarkers in a given patient. And also the fact that these biomarkers will be not your EGFR mutation, which stays forever. It will be dynamic, things change as the, as the treatment uh, progresses. But let's focus on one aspect, which is the CCR2, CCL2 uh, pathway, which is the one which helps to recruit the macrophages in the tumor cells. And, uh, and there is evidence that uh, uh, it also correlates with poor prognosis. And, and again, it's a target that has been shown that you can Im improve the chemotherapy effect by hitting that target, reducing the ingress of the myeloid cells into the tumor, and also improve the T cell response. This, this is really work still uh, happening um, as we speak. Now, this is a study which uh, uh, was published in the, in the Lancet Oncology. It's a very interesting study, and I liked it very much. And I was one of the reviewers, and then they asked me to write like an editorial on it. Because the reason I liked the study was not so much that I think that this is going to be the, the answer for pancreatic cancer, but the way it was done. And this is exactly what we were talking about when we said no more phase three trials. Because we were saying that people have to do small trials like this one, 
which had, what, under 50 patients, not that many. It was not randomized, but it gave a lot of information. No journal, good journal, will really refuse the study because the way it was done. And the reason for that is they really loaded the study with a lot of correlative science to try to help you understand what's going on and also to help you decide whether they're really meeting the proof of concept test. And this study included a drug which is called PF something, and it's a Pfizer drug, which Pfizer had for immunological conditions, for rheumatological conditions, and they decided it's a dumb drug. They put it on the shelf until the investigator who did the study, uh, and this will be people from uh, WashU, so he found that in preclinical work, it's interesting, so they went into doing this study in patients with localized disease. They showed interesting results, and guess what? The company is already doing the phase three, the phase randomized phase two trial, combining it with GEM, not Paclitaxel, prospective trial. So this is a, a very interesting, and I call this type of work myself, I call it boutique type of research, which is different than, let's put like 140 patients in their randomized phase two trial, non-selected and all that. So at this time, there's this trial which is ongoing, and there's this other molecule which is similar. It's from a, a much smaller company than Pfizer, and I don't know what the future of this, com of this uh, uh, molecule is. It was presented at phase one in, in the ASCO GI, which was a few days, a few weeks ago. Okay, so, so you have something there which you can work on. Now, the other thing which you can also start thinking about, which people are doing the clinical trials, but it's not as simple as you think, will be uh, the DNA repair defects. So patients with tumors of pancreatic cancer, this has been studied in a very nice article by Waddell et al. in Nature, and they showed the subgroup of patients who harbor DNA repair defects. And these, this subgroup of patients may be a target or a good candidate for uh, doing, uh, for treatments that may exploit that deficiency. Now, for most of us, we think that it's simple. Oh yeah, BRCA2 mutations. Yeah, that's true. But this is really, just to warn you, this is beyond BRCA2 mutations. And hence the challenge for you for another 20 years of projects and to find which patients you're going to be selecting out for this type of work. So DNA repair defects. And they showed that you can use platinum compounds. And remember, DNA repair is very important because in 2015, uh, it was the Nobel Prize which was given to, a DNA, to the DNA repair group. This is an example of a patient I have, and, and I don't want you to go out and think that this is the way it should be all the time. Um, so a guy who was in his early seven, late 60s, you give them Gemnap Agitaxel, there's really no response at all. And then you give them Folfox half-heartedly thinking we're not going to respond to chemo, and he responds for more, over a year, he's doing well. And then you send them to MD Anderson, the first thing they do, because they're smart, did you do genomic profiling? He says, no, I didn't. This was a few years ago. So I check it out, and it's BRCA2 mutations. So this patient had BRCA2 mutations, and the question is, if I knew he had BRCA2 mutations, why did I waste my time maybe giving them that packet to start over? This is the sort of thing which is now being tested, and something which may make sense in some patients, but I don't think it's as simple as that. There is evidence from retrospective trials, the platinum compounds can do better in BRCA2 mutations. And there's also evidence that single agent PARP inhibitors can have activity in patients with BRCA2 mutations, whether they're prostate, in this case, including pancreatic cancer. So it's a field which is moving along. But again, the real warning here is that it's not as simple as you think. If you look at the, if you, if you, if you look at the pathways that involve DNA repair, nature is not dumb to just, uh, give the responsibility for BRCA2 only. It has a number of other things in the pathways which you have to be aware of. So that's something for you to learn. Nevertheless, there are a number of trials currently ongoing looking at uh, patients who have uh, BRCA2 mutations, PARP inhibitors, platinum compounds, and we'll, we'll wait to see what happens to these trials. So uh, some of them are global trials because this is not a, and if you ask me what's the population, what's the proportion of patients who have BRCA2 mutations, it will be in the region of nine to 10 percent max and half of them will be genomic, sorry, um, germline, and the other will be patients who develop the mutations as a somatic mutation. Okay, so one of the things which, uh, which, uh, uh, which happens in smart places when we send patients to University of Michigan, they go, we don't send them, they go for a second opinion, 35 miles away. Oh, the, your doctor should be doing genomic profiling. 
Well, the, Dr. Dr. Philip did genomic profiling for the last 50 patients I did, and the only thing you see is KRAS, KRAS, KRAS in every patient, and lots of, of uh, tumor suppressor gene mutations. And what do you do with these tumor suppressor gene mutations? Uh, lots of them. P16, P53, SMAT4, and uh, therapeutically, what do you do? And there's nothing. I, I, maybe you, have, you guys have something, but I don't have anything for those. And you can see the rare BRCA2. You can see the rare HER2 new, maybe the rare 1% MSI. But we're looking at these. So one of the interesting compounds is a, is a drug which, uh, which inhibits a transporter, which is CREM1 or X, XP01. So the tumor suppressor genes are transcribing those good proteins. And they are the nucleus, but in cancer cells, there will be a transporter which pumps them out of the nucleus. They have to stay in the nucleus. That's where they should be doing their job. But the transporter gets rid of them from the nucleus and pumps it into the cytoplasm. So there are a class of drugs that try to inhibit these, uh, these transporters. And one of them is a drug called Selinexor, which some of you might be aware of because it's gone into hematological cancers. And this drug is an inhibitor of this. It's a, it was the first in class. It was developed by a company that's now gone public, Tarja Farm, and, and our lab has been very much involved with them in the development in, in pancreatic cancer. And this is just a summary of, a, of an article which was uh, in gastroenterology a few years ago, uh, which helped to identify the, uh, the drug, the potential uh, uh, possible in pancreatic cancer. And just to not go into a lot, a lot of details, uh, we went after that to develop a, a clinical trial, which is currently ongoing in patients with, uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer, combining with gemcitabine, not pancreatoxin. OK, no, no talk is complete unless you talk about uh, immunotherapy in, this, in, in cancer, because all the patients come to us with them. Uh, and I like this, uh, probably Basel has seen it 10 times. Uh, I myself, I don't, I don't read medical journals. Uh, I read Economist, I read the Wall Street Journal, maybe some of you might not like it. I also read the New York Times. Um, if, uh, because these things can give you a, an insight during meetings like ASCO or AACR on what is really worth following because they know where the money is. And this is the Economist, the, the week that the ASCO was in 2015 because that was the week where there was a lot of discussion and new, new information about PD-1, PD-1 inhibition. So now there are, there are five now. We have chemotherapy, target therapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and, and immunotherapy came next. However, pancreas cancer, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's, it's typically immunosuppressive environment. And, um, and I can tell you that the single, a single target approach of PD-1, PD-1 inhibitors, or even the vaccine didn't work. So, there's another uh, 100 years for you to go and work on. Uh, there's a lot of work you can do. You can produce 69,000 R1s on that because it's a rich area because it has potential. And the potential is not like, oh, what, what do I do with PD-1? Do I find a new biomarker? For, do I do a new monoclonal antibody to find a better uh, testing for pd one That's not the point. The point is that it's putting the drugs together. And that's really what. And even the one I showed you about the CCL2, CCR2, CCL2 inhibit, uh, CCR2 inhibitor, that also feeds in into this type of work, and even in a repair. So what we, what, why we think it's not, uh, this is, I think I put the arrow in the wrong place. I, uh, the pancreas cancer is somewhere low here. I can't read well. Uh, pancreas cancer doesn't produce that many uh, uh, of the immunogenic uh, mutations that happen in the, uh, in, in, the, in the DNA. And in fact, if you look here, it's somewhere in this half of the curve. Here you have melanoma on top, melanoma on top. So to have uh, mutations uh, that create neoantigens that can be a good stimulus for immune response, uh, pancreas cancer does less than uh, many other tumors. And that, and that we think with our simple mind is the reason why our PDL1, PD1 inhibitors don't work. But I think it's much more complex than that. And part of it is what I explained to you. We have those immunosuppressive elements, one of them being the macrophages. So what we need to do, what the thought is that we have to fuel the engine. So you have to fuel the engine, load in with as much as you can with antigens and T cells. And also you have to release the brakes. So this is where, where your PD-1 type of uh, molecules, which we have at this time, I'm sure there will be more which will have. So that's the idea. Well, having said that, people are already doing clinical trials. 
And you can see that a number of combinations. So when the vaccine work didn't uh, pan out, people said, oh yes, it didn't pan out because we need a, a checkpoint inhibitor. Well, we have one. We had a study doing that. Um, ACP196 is a BTK inhibitor, um, which is another ibrutinib uh, type drug. And it also works on the uh, macrophages and uh, myodrive cells. And again, the combination with a PD-1 inhi uh, PD inhibitor. A number of other uh, studies. And I want to also acknowledge the fact that SBRT uh, radiotherapy, high dose uh, radiotherapy can also release antigens and that might be a way of, again, uh, activating the immune system. And there are a lot of studies looking into that. I think you guys have one or, or planning to do one. So there are a number of trials that are ongoing. And at this point in time, the idea is that are we going to learn from these studies? I showed you one trial which I called, called a boutique trial because it, it's, it tries to, to study the biological endpoints along with the study. So if it failed, you know why it failed. If it succeeded, we know why it succeeded. But these trials, I don't know how much of them will be really uh, doing that, especially when they're run by the drug companies that tend to be more reluctant to do these, uh, uh, these types of uh, studies. So I think in a cancer center, this is where you have to do them. And you don't have to do like 100 patients. You don't have to have this many patients. You can do them in 10, 20, 30 patients for proof of concept. Now, why do I say you have another 100 years to work on these things? Because when you go back and read the literature about the potential combinations you can have with PD-1, pd one inhibitors, it's unlimited. It's really unlimited. How do you prioritize and how do you do that? And that's a big challenge. But unless you have a schema of how you're going to uh, address the work and how you're going to proceed learning from the one step and going to the next, is not going to uh, succeed. It's going to be just an empirical combination of PD-1 plus which drug company will give another drug to add to it. Now, what about RAS? Well, RAS is an early one in, in, the, in the development, although uh, I have to say that am I convinced 100% that RAS maintains its value in, in an advanced patient who you see in the clinic? That I don't know for sure. But the, the, the RAS mutations are almost 100%. In the older days when I checked on RAS in patients with pancreatic cancer, it was less. Now we do uh, next generation sequencing and you send it to outside vendor and every single patient has RAS mutation. Does it matter if, they, if, the, if the mutation frequency in the tumor is low or high? I don't know. But the problem with RAS is this. I mean, for, to make it simple, it's the golf ball. Why is it a golf ball? Because all these grooves are very shallow. It's difficult to put something in a, a groove there to stick. And that's the reason why they can't get a good drug to stick into the, into the groove in, in, the, in, the, in the molecule itself. So people are working on it. So the other way of trying to look at RAS is that can we shoot below RAS? So we can't hit RAS, but let's hit the, hit the targets that are be, below RAS that are being stimulated or fed by RAS. And uh, one study which uh, I have to tell you about is this one which was published recently. So what we did was we said, okay, RAS does not work. We, well, it doesn't work, but we can't target it. But let's try to target AKT and MEK at the same time, which, which are uh, under, underneath RAS, which go below RAS. And that would be a, a good way of trying to do that. Obviously, you go to the literature, you go to the preclinical work. Of course, you will see studies supporting your idea. Because if they've done 20 studies and two are positive, they're published, and the 18 are negative, you have no clue about who did it and which models. So we said it's doable. So we did it. But the problem was our results were wor worse than a control arm. So, so although we managed to put the two drugs together, uh, and, but, the, but the results were worse than using straight chemotherapy. But the things which we learned from this are we may need chemotherapy, maybe. The second thing is that uh, combining these drugs doesn't come without a price. Because a lot of the patients here had side effects, which also necessitated maybe to stop the treatment. And the thing is that in a patient like, in, in a disease like pancreatic cancer, you have to follow quality of life guidelines because putting drugs together is not enough because you can easily take someone off treatment, they will disappear, they say, I don't want any more treatment from you because I'm doing so badly. And that, we got a sense that that might have happened here. So, and, and when you put the two drugs together, you start to cut down on the dose to accommodate for toxicity, probably you hit, a, you hit levels of drugs that you, they're not really going to have biological activity. So combining drugs is not easy. And you can see that it was failure. 
Another approach is to go uh, to a more nodal type of uh, uh, molecule, a molecule that plays a central ro role, but it's also under, uh, under RAS. And there is now a new drug, which is in phase one, which is attacking PAC4. Again, there is work on this, which was done largely in our uh, lab. And then um, uh, this is, an, I don't want to go into details, but certainly it's a drug that showed some promise uh, as, a, uh, as an alternative to hitting RAS itself. But then again, it hits other uh, pathways. Uh, the government itself has an initiative, as you all know, the RAS initiative. And it's, this, is, this is really, these are not molecules. These are, these are the investigators around the world who are really networking together to crack the RAS pathway. And there's money for it, and hopefully it stays. We'll, we'll never know what happens to that money. But certainly, uh, there's uh, something which people are trying to find a way of trying to inhibit RAS, because it's not only for pancreatic cancer, obviously, for other cancers. So where do we stand now? So for the young people in the, in the, in the room, we have some leads on RENA repair, on immune, maybe more with the macrophage thing which I showed you, but certainly there's more uh, available uh, preclinically strong. We talked about, and RAS always will be in the back of our mind. So these are the areas, and there's a lot of overlap, and that's where really where the fun comes, because it's not going to be able to hit one spot here and then assume the patient's going to benefit. But also there are a number of other concepts that are being tested now uh, from MMP9 inhibition, which may or may not, my guess is not going to work, and a number of other things, um, antibodies to mesothelene, uh, TGF beta, there's also work uh, on some of the other elements in the stem cell like STAT. All these things are being done, but if you, if you use the concept of has any single target worked in this disease, um, I don't know what's going to happen. And again, if you look at the gene mutations, as this is just an expansion of what I was talking before, really we don't have that many that we can go after, uh, these are driver mutations. So for that reason, I think we have to make a, a major shift in our thinking and stop thinking that we're going to hit a gene that's going to do something, and we have to go into pathways. And the pathways becomes much more difficult because now you're putting a number of biomarkers together, and how do you do that? Well, I don't know. I'm not an expert in biomarker development. We can look at immune profiles, trauma scoring, the DNA repair defect uh, profiles, and it, goes, it can go on and on and on. But the problem with this is that this is also dynamic, as I mentioned to you earlier. If you start treatment today and six months later, these pathways can change because the way you have interfered with them with therapy or disease progression. So there is a lot to be done. And then when you talk about biomarkers, in my opinion, we're at point zero in this disease. And many other diseases, I have to say, except for the ones that, as I said, they're lucky to have a gene mutation that's a driver mutation. In fact, in fact, if you go back to 2008, that was the first publication on DNA mutations in, in this disease that came from the Johns Hopkins group. They, in 2008, that was almost 10 years ago, they said that the best hope for development would be agents that target physiological effects of altered pathways rather than individual genes. So they said that. And, and 10 years later, we see, we see that they were correct. And agents that broadly target downstream mediators may be the way to go. So that's the message here. Now, um, the Pancreatic Action Network, which is really now the de facto organization de uh, uh, leading uh, pancreatic cancer research, uh, has, this to, uh, uh, has this initiative, which is the Precision Promise uh, Trial. It's a clinical trial, involves 10 groups, 10 institutions, and it's going to look into a number of areas, but I, I don't want to really spend more, uh, more time on this just to let, introduce you to it, because uh, I'm part of the uh, the group, so I know this is still work in, uh, in progress. And one of the major things, obviously you have to get the buy-in of drug companies, and they're getting that. But one of the major things is that how do you do your design of the clinical trials uh, prospectively, because you're not going to do it in 100 patients and then move to the next 100 patients. It has to be in a more dynamic, more, uh, more informative way, and that's really one of the challenges when it comes to this concept. Because you, you're not going to, oh, I, one day I'm going to do I'm going to do a high HA, and I'm going to spend another 140 patients to, and next comes the, it's not going to be working that way. It's a different way of that working group. So hopefully in the future we will know more exactly how they're going to plan doing it. Because this is, 
happening, coming soon, but it hasn't started yet. The other thing is that uh, we talk about major gene mutations and the pathways, but when you talk to people who are experts in, in, bio, uh, in uh, Simpson biology, uh, it, it also appears that you may have a gene that is not even overexpressed, but the way it's placed the product in a way that it may be critical in, in, in that pathway. But you might not pick it up in any of the uh, th ways we think of doing these things. So that's something which uh, brings back the, to my mind, why isn't systems biology not being used more and more? And I think the reason I know, because it's, it's difficult. It, it also depends on specimens from patients, tumors, representative tumors, as we move along in the patient's natural history. And these are things that are difficult, but maybe these are the ones which are going to give us an answer in the future. Just to finish off, especially for the young people and if there are any fellows in, in, the, in the group, um, we think of uh, pancreatic cancer uh, drugs, genes, pathways, bioinformatics, you know, everything. But you have to think of the patients as patients. Uh, over the last week, I've seen maybe several patients came to me, they want to be on a clinical trial. And most of them, I couldn't put them on a clinical trial. We, because what, CT, what you see on, in a clinical trial is not the reality in this disease. The median age of patients is 71. On clinical trials, it's early 60s, so 10 years younger. Most patients we see have performance status uh, two or three, despite the fact the fellow comes back and says, oh, performance status zero. No, the patient doesn't have zero. It's a, it's a three or a two. Uh, how, do, how did you make that comment? And, um, and fatigue is a very important side effect of chemotherapy, and patients have limitations of fatigue. So we are not really representing most of our patients we see in the clinic. And if you see patients, if you see publications saying the median survival of metastatic pancreatic cancer is six months, it's really wrong. The median survival is three to four months because we don't include patients who don't ever come to even see you. So, so we have to think of the quality of life of the patient. But again, you will tell me, oh, we always do that. Well, of course we do. But we also have to think of trials or, or things to look into supportive care. Because supportive care becomes very, very important in this disease. And it's important because it allows you to save delivery of the chemotherapy, but also it prevents the early discontinuation of treatment, maybe, and, and, in, and all, all subsequent treatments. So it's very important for us to really focus on supportive care alongside uh, treating the patients with chemotherapy. And so it's not only chemotherapy, scans and this and that. You have to treat the patient uh, and provide the supportive care early and not wait too, it's too late. So, this is my conclusion slide. Moving forward, so conventional cytotoxics alone are unlikely to produce, uh, to produce a major uh, advantage. Now, I'm not saying you have to dismiss the existing cytotoxic. I'm not saying that. But if you come to me and say, I want to do another study of three, 400 patients, replace cytotoxic A with cytotoxic B, or slip in another cytotoxic, you know, you can do that. But I don't think it's going to go anywhere in terms of really moving the field forward. Um, Again, there should be a lot, when you, when you plan to do a randomized trial, especially when you're putting 300 patients in a trial, you really have to have a robust, a robust uh, uh, proof of concept before you do that. A p-value, unfortunately, is good for investors maybe, but it's not good for patients. And, um, and again, we have to focus on the disease process or molecular classifiers. We have to have a way where we're moving uh, out of this idea of the single gene. We have to know how to classify the disease. Now, colon cancer have been ahead of us. They have the classifiers, although even then, I don't know how much that's affecting the day-to-day -day practice. So, but that probably gives you a bit of a closer look at the patient's uh, biology than just uh, a single gene mutation. Um, and the biomarkers should be progressively refined. You can't just have a biomarker and say, this is it. Uh, you really have to do that. And that's really one of the problems we have in that we, we don't spend enough time, effort, or put enough mind into the biomarkers. And the biomarkers are not going to be in this disease the way you think of uh, uh, ALK mutations or EGFR mutations, et cetera. And supportive care is very important. And, um, and with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Detroit, by the way, is a city worth visiting if you, if you want to do that. So things are getting better. Yes, Dr. Rillery is, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, so we, we're very uh, happy the way things are going in Detroit. Um, uh, and the reason why I mention that is, uh, is that when there is hope in Detroit, I hope there's hope also in pancreatic cancer because Detroit 
when Basel was with us, uh, we had conversations which we always concluded that there's no hope, but it happened. I hope that same thing will happen for pancreatic cancer. So um, I don't know if people who don't know Detroit, so this is GM, you know, very hopeful place. It was bankrupt, we're doing well. And that's the Detroit River and that's Canada. And my nurses who work uh, in the clinic get to the hospital quicker than I do. I live in the suburbs, so they just cross the bridge. Thank you very much.